Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to another webinar arranged by CCI. Now CCI doesn't need any introduction and I would like to first of all thank wholeheartedly Dr. Anish Krishna for creating this concept of chess council of uh, making us connected to each other and helping us staying in touch with each other through all the hard work that it does. Simply the background work that goes on connecting so many thousands of pulmonologists is, is phenomenal. It's hats off. Dr. Narayan Pradeep, who has been uh, the soul and heart of CCI, I thank you all. And we'll be talking today about uh, interventions during COVID times. It's an interesting topic. You know, Dr. Vijay Kumar, uh, when he said that we want this topic to be uh, held, it sounded very interesting, exciting that, yes, as pulmonologists, we are very interested in doing in, uh, interventions. All of us have now started doing bronchoscopies, even in COVID patients. But we have no guidelines. So up till now, till very recently, we had no guidance. We had a lot of fear, a lot of skepticism, a lot of doubts. So we thought, let's just clear all those things today. So for helping me out in this uh, next two hour venture, I have with me uh, my elite panelists. Uh, we have first Dr. Balaraju. Dr. Balaraju needs no introduction. He's a well-known pulmonologist and an intensivist. He's from Vishakapatnam. He does a lot of interventions and he has been very kind enough to share his knowledge with us regularly on WhatsApp groups. So he'll be speaking about uh, his experience doing interventions during the COVID times. Then we have Dr. Shweta Bansal. Uh, she is uh, from Delhi. She has been, uh, she has European diploma in adult respiratory medicine. She's an MBD and BDM. And she is now senior consultant and interventional pulmonologist at the Department of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, Delhi Heart and Lung Institute in Delhi. And we have Dr. Bharat Anil Toshniwal, uh, Dr. Bharat is, has uh, again MD and DNB and his fellowship in interventional bronchoscopy from uh, Malaysia. He also has certificate uh, course of allergy and immunology from BP Chest and currently practices mainly in uh, Nanded uh, at his Toshniwal Chest Hospital and Schwas Chest Hospital and has been, uh, you know, he has been an invited speaker at multiple national and international seminars and has got many presentations to his name. So, Without further ado, I am Dr. Mayul Trekkar. I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a pulmonologist practicing in uh, Mumbai. And I would now uh, hand over the session to our speakers. So there has been a slight change of plan and I think it is gonna be worth it. We were actually going to go with the flow of the seminar, but as we all know, and as we all have been wishing him, it's Dr. Krishna's birthday today. So I would like to wish him a very happy birthday and hand over the mic to Dr. Vijay and Dr. Narayan Pradeep. Very good evening, one and all. Uh, Krishna Anna is also, you know, on live. Thank you, Anna, for, uh, you know, joining us in the webinar and made it more, you know, live. And uh, many, many more happy returns of the day. The name Krishna Anna means a lot to Indian pulmonology, particularly young breed. Yes, I don't have any hesitation to say this. He has uh, been, you know, uh, very vital in designing this CCI. And uh, I was looking forward for, okay, what are the various qualities that Krishnana has imported uh, to Indian pulmonology and young chest physicians when we look he practices ethics and teaches ethics. He practices honesty and then teaches the same. Like that, if you look on for this, okay, there are many, in fact, not many, most of his nights, he used to sleep at probably around 3 a.m. He used to work for, you know, uh, CCI day and night. And the amount of you know, service, the what I can say, uh, it is unparalleled. And uh, on this, uh, I, I feel really uh, very proud to speak on behalf of entire Indian pulmonology on the CCA webinar platform to communicate uh, wholehearted wishes from entire 
Indian pulmonology. Anna, entire Indian pulmonology is wishing you a very, very happy birthday. Live you a, a, a very long, healthy, quality life and then lead us from front, um, all the young budding pulmonologists and even senior pulmonologists. And uh, it is indeed great honor for me to um, talk on behalf of entire CCA. Narayana, over to you. Uh, yes, that was, uh, I wish our chairman trustee, Dr. N. H. Krishna, a very happy and happy birthday. I wish he is now coming online to... He's already there. <laughs> yeah. So on behalf of entire CCI, I wish him a happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vijay and uh, uh, Narayan Pradipa and the rest of the CCI. Yeah, that was a pleasant surprise. I suddenly got a phone call a minute ago. Uh, and uh, fortunately, on Thursday on a webinar day, my birthday has come. I'm beyond words to express my uh, gratification towards uh, dear Vijay, Narayan Pradeep, and um, the panelists uh, present here, the entire test council of India. Um, I'm like uh, at loss of words uh, because so much of love and affection. Um, somebody should be so lucky to fetch that in one lifespan, which God has gifted to me via all of you and the CCA. Um, uh, I'm at loss of words and uh, nothing else. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, we had some uh, few deaths in our uh, like one, uh, one one death and one critical accident uh, within a month span in our family. Uh, so uh, I was uh, like, I don't know, I was not sure that whether I would come, but suddenly two minutes before uh, Chanam Chetty called me and uh, I'm here, but uh, all that sorrow is wiped out now via your love and affection and I'm so happy. Hope such young breed always because this young breed, this young breed which is sitting here right now, Mehul, Shweta, Balaraju, Anil. So I'm very sure they are the future of India and such young breed should always give an opportunity. And that is the simplest task what I did. I didn't do anything great. Uh, it was my intention to come ahead with uh, young brigade. And that has become successful today. And I'm, uh, I would like to extend one more uh, warm word of appreciation to all of you, like uh, Mehul, Shweta, Balraju, and uh, Anil. I would like to tell you that you, the way you people are performing nowadays in the webinar or also on live platform, you are doing better than the senior stalwarts. And everybody is convinced because for long span, you have proven repeatedly yourself. And uh, frankly speaking, you made CCA proud for the faith we had in. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, there was a disturbance from my side for the initiation of the webinar. And uh, I hope the webinar continues and it comes out with uh, always, like usually, colorful. Thank you, everyone. Each one from the Central Committee and many from you know uh, the CCI uh, life membership groups, they wanted uh, to name, but in, in the interest of time, we cannot, but they want to communicate their love and affection on the live, Anna. Thank you so Frankly, much for joining. Just now I came online from morning till now. I have not turned on my internet only. Mm -hmm. So I'm yet to see the WhatsApp messages. I'm yet to see uh, whatever Facebook, everything, I'm yet to see. I just turned on internet now. Right. So thank you, everyone. Right. Uh, thanks to those who expressed thanks. to come and wish me here. Thank you so much. Namaste, Anna. Take care. Namaste. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank um, you. Vinod, over to Dr. Balraju presentation. Dr. Balraju, <laughs> please take over the mic. Thank you.
Thanks, Mehul, for the kind introduction. First, I would like to uh, thank Dr. N. H. Krishna sir, Dr. Ravi Dosa, and Dr. Vijay for giving me an opportunity to speak in this esteemed forum. So, the topic we are going to discuss now is bronchoscopy in COVID era. We are going to see in another 15 minutes time. So, this will be the agenda for the 15 minutes. So, what are the indications of bronchoscopy in COVID era? The role of personal protective equipment and uh, role of uh, bronchoscopy aerosol box. So general principle to be followed during a bronchoscopy procedure, disinfection and suit requirements of the bronchoscopy room. So to start with, as we all know, COVID is a highly infectious disease. The primary route of transmission is through aerosols. Bronchoscopy is an aerosol generating procedure. So is it advisable to avoid all the aerosol generating procedures, especially bronchoscopy, whenever it is possible. If it is uh, necessary, definitely we need to do the procedure with utmost precaution, so basically to reduce the transmission to the healthcare workers. So how do you categorize the patients? We categorize patients into three groups. One is the COVID positive. So when you say COVID positive, when you, say, when you have a positive RT-PCR report or a rapid antigen test, uh, irrespective of the clinical signs and symptoms. So when you say high suspect, when you have symptoms of COVID in 14 days time or the person is in close contact or uh, with a suspicious or a confirmed patient of COVID-19 or the person has visited um, high risk um, areas uh, for COVID in the last 14 days or if the patient HSCT is suggestive of COVID. So any of these four features, if the patient is having, then it should be considered as a high suspect. And uh, even though RT-PCR is negative, the patient should be considered as a high suspect when you have the following four uh, features. So when you say low suspect, when the patient doesn't have any of those uh, four features, negative RT-PCR, no history of upper respiratory infection, then you call it COVID low suspect. That means absolutely normal patient who require a bronchoscopy. So ideally, every patient undergoing bronchoscopy should be assumed as COVID suspect and universal precaution should be always taken for, for, uh, while performing every procedure. So starting with the history, basically we require three main things. One is the history, RT-PCR and a uh, HRCT report. So in the history, we all know how the COVID presents, its onset duration and progression, starting with the upper respiratory and the lower respiratory symptoms. We need to uh, strictly ask for a contact history with a positive case, whether the patient is a primary or a secondary contact. Travel history, probably not necessary as of now because COVID must become an endemic in many of the areas. So what about the RT-PCR? When do you should you do the RT-PCR uh, for performing a bronchoscopy? So ideally, it is advisable to do 24 hours to 48 hours before the procedure to do a nasopharyngeal or a oropharyngeal swabs. So negative RT-PCR does not root out COVID-19 as its sensitivity is low and should be always repeat an RT-PCR if the clinical scenario or the HRCT is suggestive of COVID. So when do you do an HRCT scan? Preferably the day prior or the day of procedure. Try to minimize the time frame between the imaging and the procedure. So all atypical or intermittent appearances should be treated as COVID-19 suspects. So how do you uh, categorize the indications of bronchoscopy? So basically, we can categorize them into three main different uh, groups. So how, why should you do it? Because there are certain indications where you definitely do a bronchoscopy in urgent uh, uh, times, or you can definitely say you can postpone this procedure safely for a couple of weeks. So what are the urgent indications? When you have a symptomatic large airway obstruction due to the mass lesion or a luminal stenosis, when the patient is very symptomatic, probably there is an urgent need to do a bronchoscopy. When you have foreign body aspiration, when you have migrated stent or a massive hemoptosis for airway control. So these are the four main indications where you perform urgent bronchoscopy. When you can definitely defer the uh, uh, procedure for a couple of weeks, and later you can term them as COVID low suspect once they cross 14 days. Basically for uh, transbronchial cryolung biopsy or transbronchial lung biopsy, forceps biopsy for evaluation of ILD, for evaluation of non-massive hemoptysis when the patient has slight hemoptysis for routine bronchoscopic evaluation, mild tricheobronchial stenosis which does not have significant symptoms, a routine follow-up of patients for airway stents, and to do a check bronchoscopy for lung transplant resemblance or to perform a bronchial thermoplasty or a BLVR. So these are the six main uh, indications where you can definitely say you can postpone the procedure safely 
if the patient is COVID positive for at least for a couple of weeks, probably two weeks. So what are the se semi-elective uh, bronchoscopy indications where you need to plan within a few days where the need is more than the differing the patient? Basically, if you have an immunocompromised or a post-lung transplant patient with a new onset of lungs in, uh, lung infiltrates where you require a ball, so you need to perform within a few days when you suspect lung cancer or to stage the lung cancer, you need to do a um, bronchoscopy. When you have a lower atelic test, which does not resolve in all the other uh, necessary measures, you need to perform. Or when you suspect a pulmonary tuberculosis or a drug-resistant tuberculosis where the patient cannot bring the sputum or the sputum is negative. So we need to plan these patients as early as possible. So we need to take utmost precautions while performing BAL or um, as a uh, definitive uh, therapeutic procedure in these cases. So definitely for diagnosing uh, COVID, there is no role of BAL, even though the bronchial alert fluid has the highest sensitivity for diagnosing COVID. So coming to the role of personal protective equipment, we have four main categories that's starting from uh, disposable surgical three, three ply masks to N95 mask, elastomeric respirators and a PAP, and that is powered air purifier respirator. So each and each individual um, respirator or um, uh, mask has its own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so we're going to see about uh, this in a couple of uh, next slides. So is respiratory alone is sufficient? Probably, probably no. We need to have eye protection with goggles, flash shields. We need to wear gloves. We need to have full PPE suits, leggings, shoe covers, and also a head cap or hood. So basically to uh, um, protect ourselves from droplet contamination. So coming to the PPE, so three-ply surgical masks are ineffective and not recommended for performing bronchoscopy. N95 respirators or elastomeric masks are equally effective in protecting the bronchoscopies. And they're equally good. Mask or respirator is part of the PPE and in isolation does not offer complete protection to the operator. So you need to have the full care. So PAPR is highly, has a high efficiency where there is no fobbing, there's no claustrophobia and there is no need to do a fit test. Unlike for N95 or an elastomeric mask, we need to do a fit test to see whether the it fits properly. For as a PAPR, you don't require a fit test. There are only two main indications. One in high-risk procedure, it's an, a, a, again, it's an option. It's not that it is only recommended or, or when the fit test fail, when you have a loose fitting um, Elastomeric mask or an N95 mask, you can offer a PAPR, but definitely it comes at a cost. The cost of the PAPR anyway is around 1 lakh. This N95 mask hardly costs around 100 rupees. Elastomeric mask probably costs around a couple of thousand rupees. So what are the general principles to be followed during bronchoscopy uh, while, perform, uh, while performing bronchoscopy? So obviously the room should have minimal staff as much as possible. Probably you don't want to infect many uh, persons inside the uh, bronchoscopy room. There should be a designated downing and doffing areas for the operator. Ideally you require a negative pressure room with minus 2.5 uh, Pascal's pressure and with a 12 air exchange per hour. 12 air exchange per hour. So what is 12 exchange? Uh, air exchange means, so in one hour, the total room uh, air capacity should be exchanged 12 times. So if you have that much of uh, air exchange, then it is ideal to perform high risk procedures. Obviously it is very, very difficult to have uh, negative pressure rooms and uh, with the HIPAA filters and 12 air exchanges. It's not possible in most of the centers, including my center. So you can always modify your room to. Um, modify your uh, suite to place uh, exhaust fans and to allow uh, natural uh, ventilation from the other side so that you can uh, try to avoid uh, droplet contamination as much as possible. Uh, because you are uh, performing bronchoscopy, it is an uh, aerosol generating procedure. The room should be closed. The door should be closed. Personal protective gear for all the staff, coveralls, gloves, uh, and 95 masks. And you need to reduce the formats like paper, books, ob uh, objects inside the bronchoscopy room because you need to disinfect the room once you perform the bronchoscopy with a hypochlorite solution. So you need to uh, limit the number of procedures per day and you need to limit the number of persons inside. So senior physicians should perform the bronchoscopy. Probably you should not uh, allow trainees or observers in the bronchoscopy room to avoid um, uh, uh, infection. 
brothers there should be at least two people competent enough to perform the procedure if one uh, person ppe gets compromised so post procedure bronchoscopy should uh, surface disinfection is done with hypochlorite solution minimum 20 minutes gap should be there between two procedures and specimens once collected should be transported in an airtight uh, container and uh, followed designated path so that you don't cross contaminate the specimens how do you do pre procedure prepare preparation obviously you do screening with uh, uh, history taking uh, hrct and rt pcr then you categorize them uh, where they fall and do uh, see whether they require the bronchoscopy immediately or you can defer the patient so i avoid entry of attenders to the pre procedure uh, room unless it is very essential all patients should wear a three ply surgical mask and avoid lignocaine nebulization or cricothyroid injection prior to the procedure as they are aerosol generating uh, um, uh, procedures so pre procedure medications including dexamethorphan or codeine can be used so codeine can be used in a dose of 0.4 mg per kg 60 minutes prior to the procedure so usually you get codeine uh, as a 10 mg in uh, 5 ml uh, uh, cough syrup you can uh, for a 60 kg adult you can at least use um, 15 ml of uh, uh, codeine Uh, 60 minutes before the procedure so what are the precautions to be taken during performing uh, procedure the most important is to minimize the cough so how do you do it you minimize the cough by using uh, uh, conscious sedation with the uh, midazolam or fentanyl they are equally good effective in reducing the cough and whenever possible if the patient is a covid positive definitely general anesthesia should be considered either with an i gel or an endotracheal tube endotracheal tube is preferred um, uh, uh, over i gel because i gel is still not tight fitting and still there is a chance of uh, leak whereas endotracheal tube uh, can be safely secured so you need to monitor the vitals so whenever possible you better to use a slotted face mask so that you can pass the bronchoscopy through the aperture so better to pass uh, through the nose than to the mouth because they say that uh, passing the mouth can uh, trigger more cough probably the patient may uh, have uh, better uh, flexibility with using it uh, through nose so whenever possible if you have a bronchoscopy safety box it is definitely decreases the uh, droplet contamination and aerosol transmission so what is the role of single use bronchoscopy and a reusable bronchoscope definitely single use bronchoscopy doesn't require um, major equipment because they come in a pre packed uh, sterile uh, pack so there is usually a small uh, monitor and uh, um, uh, pre uh, pre packed uh, bronchoscope they are smaller in size easily portable so you can perform the procedure in the patient's own uh, isolation uh, room so Uh, so transfer the car trolley recording software everything can be very easy if you are uh, doing with a single use uh, bronchoscope and there is no risk of cross contamination or fomet infection transmission obviously it comes at a cost each bronchoscope anyway costs around 50000 uh, rupees uh, so we need to see the local uh, uh, factors for each for performing a single use bronchoscope so what are the advantages of traditional reusable bronchoscope it is operator familiar and there are better vision compared to a single use bronchoscope so how do you disinfect the bronchoscope once you perform the procedure there are no separate guidelines available it is the same level of high disinfection should be followed starting from inspection lead test enzymatic cleaning and followed by high level disinfection with glutaraldehyde that's what we do every time or a gas sterilization So just only couple of slide for bronchoscopy aerosol box this is just an uh, a video demonstrating uh, the contamination of um, uh, droplets if with box and without box as you can see without without the box you can see contamination over the face shield whereas with box there is no contamination over the face so that's the advantage of having a bronchoscopy aerosol box so should we use it probably yes when should we use this when should we use probably when you are performing bronchoscopy in spontaneously ventilated patients if you are intubated probably there is no direct exposure uh, to healthcare workers probably the box is not required so this is just couple of uh, videos uh, where you can perform uh, uh, bronchoscopy with uh, with an uh, aerosol box when i am doing in case of uh, vocal cord biopsy and another case of uh, bal 
so definitely not comfortable but uh, it's always better to uh, use maximum precautions as possible so what's the role of rigid bronchoscopy in uh, covid era generally rigid bronchoscopy needs to be avoided if possible it's better to if you can perform the case and uh, uh, igl or an endotracheal tube it's better to do it in in those uh, types the flexible bronchoscope and if rigid bronchoscopy is unavoidable then you can always avoid the jet ventilation because there is direct transmission of uh, aerosols and uh, whenever possible better to use the flu fog attachment so that there is no direct contact of aerosol to the face so to to summarize every patient undergoing bronchoscopy should be uh, assumed as covid suspect and universal precautions should always be taken so it is very difficult to have an ideal bronchoscopy suite so maximum precautions should be taken to reduce droplet exposures like minimal staff use of sedation cough suppressant and no pre procedure lignocaine uh, nebulization tarian methods like mask with slotted aperture or a bronchoscopy box so no special disinfection for bronchoscope regular protocol disinfection is good enough post procedure bronchoscopy room surface disinfection with hypochlorite solution and avoid rigid bronchoscopy whenever possible so we have on indian guidelines uh, consensus guidelines uh, for flexible bronchoscopy in covid pandemic it's published in lung india in march 2021 thanks a lot for your patient listening thanks and um, good evening everybody um first of all i would like to thank cci team dr ravi dr krishna for giving me this opportunity so uh, today we are talking about the various interventions in covid times and uh, i am really thankful for dr mehul for the kind introduction and dr bala he has really done a very good job he has talked about bronchoscopy and really made my job easier so he has talked about bronchoscopy as an aerosol generating procedure which is one of the major procedure which generates aerosol in our day to day practice and he has talked about how to deal with it, the uh, safe practices and the measures how to do bronchoscopy and other procedures but what i am talking about is about the plural procedures how safe are they and what practice measures shall we take to prevent the aerosolization to protect ourselves our healthcare workers and and do the good for the patient as well so uh, the questions that i will be dealing with will be how uh, whether plural procedures are they really aerosol generating procedure or not what is a, uh, just one or two slides about the plural involvement in covid 19 and what diagnostic procedures and ther therapeutic procedures we should or we should not go about when to do which procedures what are the precautions that has been that has to be taken during or after the plural procedures like the uh, the common plural procedures like like the intercostal drainage and the thoracoscopy and what are the measures that we can take to decrease the aerosolization during the plural procedures so as now we are almost 2 years into the covid and a lot of things have happened we have encountered the first wave second wave and now we are into the third wave and but now covid has become is becoming a part of our normal life so uh, should what should we do about the procedures in the first and the second way we used to postpone most of our procedures but now it is becoming a part of our life so what what shall, should be our strategy where we should do the procedures what what measures we should follow so to begin with uh, the the common plural procedures that we do in our day to day practice in icus are the chest icd insertion for pneumothorax the plural tap and more importantly the medical thoracoscopy for the diagnosis of uh, undiagnosed uh, exudative pleural effusions and for pleural biopsy so these are the common procedures but are they really aerosol generating procedures the what cdc cdc says that pleural procedures uh, the, there is a list of procedures which are aerosol generating procedures according to the cdc guideline but the pleural procedures does not come under it the ma main one are the bronchoscopy is the endotracheal intubation the suctioning and obviously the nebulization but what are potential aerosol generating procedures are the ones who are likely to induce cough which should be performed cautiously and be avoided if possible so what i consider that plural procedures are one of the potential aerosol generating procedures and they are very relevant to the open procedures like thoracoscopy and putting the indwelling pleural catheters and in pneumothorax who which in which there is an air leak which in which we have bronchopleural fistulas where there is a gush of air where there there are chances of 
uh, aerosolization and in, uh, transmitting it to the doctors, to the healthcare workers, and to the other patients as well who are in the same ICU, if it is done in the ICU settings. So these plural procedures can be a like of silent super spreader. We might consider that the, though these are closed procedures, they will not lead to aerosolization, but no, they, they, they might be a super spreader of the COVID infection. Uh, most like, for example, like when we uh, put an ICD, there may be a splash of uh, fluid that comes out. This splash of fluid can definitely be a uh, source of infection for the for the doctors who for the proceduralist who is doing it and uh, the other healthcare workers who are assisting in the procedure. And one of the most important uh, uh, cause for the aerosolization while doing plural procedure is when we are putting air uh, air uh, chest tube drain and there is an air leak. Whenever we put an uh, put a chest tube, there is a gush of air that comes in. Normally also, but if there is an air leak, this again this is a, a source of continuous air leaking from the ICD and from the uh, water seal bag from the outlet. There is a continuous air leak, which is a source of continuous aerosolization of the atmosphere in which, in which the patient has been kept. So these are the two most important sources of. Uh, aerosolization to the ICD procedures, to the thoracoscopy that we do, and the plural tap. Uh, plural tap per se, there's just a, a prick. Uh, they may not be that much, but yes, ICD and thoracoscopy, they can be super spreader of the infections. So it is very important to stratify the procedures according to the indication, and we have to try it, which are the urgent one, which are the emergent emergent or the urgent one which are which we can postpone and which are life threatening and we have to take action immediately so if we just have a brief look into the what are the plural manifestations of covid-19 so in very rarely uh, plural effusions has been seen in covid-19 but whenever i see a patient of covid-19 with a plural effusion i would always try to look for an alternative diagnosis first whether the patient is having hyperproteinemia having any fluid overload or whether the patient has any evidence of cox because plural effusions per se are very very uh, very uncommon i would not say very very uncommon but still they are rarer in covid-19 infections and uh, they can be complicated uh, effusions when there is secondary infections and, and can lead to empyema as well. And spontaneous pneumothorax. In a walking patient, COVID-19, no other complaint we can encounter uh, spontaneous pneumothorax. And pneumomediastinum is very, very common, um, especially on the patients who are who were, were on NIV or who were ventilated. Pneumomediastinum is, uh, has, um, we have seen in uh, many patients. If we look into the data, uh, there has been two meta-analyses which has been published, which have shown that plural effusion is present in uh, approximately 5% of the patients. And this, has, this study has been published in uh, 2021, which showed that plural effusion occurred in about 10% of the COVID-19 patients. But most of these patients were the patients who were severe or critically ill. Most of these patients were the one who were who were having ARDS, who were mechanically ventilated. So plural effusion per se as a complication of COVID-19 is very, very uncommon, but it is mostly present in the patients who are more who are having more severe illness. If we look into this, the length of stay was also more in patients of COVID who were having plural effusion as compared to the ones who were not. And if we look into this bar chart, the mortality was also higher in patients who were having uh, plural effusions as compared to the ones who were not having plural effusions. So this indicates that the plural effusion was present mm -hmm. in the patients who were more severe and plural eff presence of plural eff effusion as a complication of COVID, we can say it's a poor prognostic indication for the morbidity and mortality for the patients of COVID. So uh, till now, especially in the first and the second wave, whenever a patient who had come to us with the, uh, for any plural procedure, maybe a with mild to moderate uh, plural effusion or uh, maybe a ice uh, with the pneumothorax, but if the patient was stable with uh, with a plural effusion and the patient was not dystonic, was not hypo hypoxemic, we tend to postpone the procedure for a few days or few weeks till the COVID cases come down, but. Is postponing the solution? No, I don't think so. Because now COVID is becoming a new normal for us. So it, it, it's not that we can keep postponing the procedures whenever indicated. And uh, even if, if you would have asked me this question in the second wave, yes, I would have definitely said, please postpone it. There are a lot, the, there, there's lack of resources. The beds are occupied. There is no oxygen. Non-COVID patients are um, there. We, we do not have bed. We do not have uh, daycare admissions as well. 
so this was a time when we i would have said yes we can postpone but now i think now we are uh, almost two years into it we are uh, the covid is becoming uh, the cases are not too mu uh, too much most of them mm -hmm. are mild cases i would still if the, if indicated i would at this point of time would go for uh, the plural procedures if the patient are mild tolerable we might defer it for a few days uh, when uh, uh, according to the number of cases that we uh, are coming but still if it is indicated the patient is dysnic the patient needs uh, diagnostic plural tapping patient needs icd for uh, the relief of symptoms i would definitely go for it rather than postponing it this is a, uh, another uh, like benign uh, cases like plural uh, benign pruritus or like benign asbestosis plural disease i would maybe for a few weeks i may defer it because it's not a dire emergency but in malignant cases also um, where there is a poor performance score we are not able to give chemotherapy of, to the patients for mm -hmm. example we have a patient of covid 19 who is positive for covid 19 we are not able to give him chemotherapy because it has to be deferred for two to three weeks at least and the patient is dysnic patient is having moderate to massive plural effusions yes definitely i would not defer from putting an icd because we cannot uh, let uh, go with the patient and uh, the patient is symptomatic we have to go for it so um, uh, we have to uh, like we have to triage the patients we have to see categorize the patients and uh, then accordingly take the decision so this was a like a kind of flow chart which has been published uh, last year which has tried to triage the various thoracic surgery and the various thoracic procedures which had divided into elective urgent and immediate life threatening so in case of urgent emergent Im and immediate life threatening we would it, there is no doubt that we would directly go for the procedure, whatever it is. We would consider the patient as a COVID positive if we uh, we do not have the report and or mm -hmm. if the report is taking time. So we would we would take it as a COVID positive patient and go with taking all the proper precautions. But what about the elective cases, as I have told? So this this elective cases you will have to decide on case to case basis, and I would recommend that if indicated at this point of time, uh, I would like to go for it. Uh, if it is really uh, indicated and uh, not to defer it uh, because um, uh, how long will we postpone it sometimes some order the time we have to if it is indicated go for it i would suggest but we will take a like call of the panelists for that after the session after uh, the end of the this lecture so uh, even uh, if the patient is coming with recurrent malignant pleural effusions and if we are not able to give uh, go for the surgeries or uh, bad surgery or if we are not able to provide chemotherapy for the patient we would i would like to go for a uh, the definitive uh, 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 management of the patient like either putting the icd and doing the pleurodesis or considering indwelling pleural catheters for the patient so that repeated hospital visit repeated hospital admissions could be avoided and similarly, the other manifestation that we talked about was the spontaneous pneumomediastinum and the pneumothorax. Though they are more, they were more common in patients who are having, uh, who were on NIV or who were on mechanical ventilation. But per se, this has also mm. been seen in patients who, uh, who had, who, who were not on positive pressure ventilation and who had come directly with a spontaneous pneumothorax. So uh, the pathophysiology is there is a formation of nematocils or cysts in COVID-19, which may rupture, uh, which may rupture even the patients who were not on positive pressure. And more importantly, they most of us um, like most of the patients were on high dose steroids, maybe moderate to high dose steroids, and this was a reason that lead to delayed lung healing and leading to more risk factor for development of spontaneous pneumothorax. Presence of higher LDH serum level and peripheral leukocyte count was also one of the express one of the markers which were indicated for high risk for developing pneumothorax during the course of the illness. So mostly in these patients of COVID nineteen who developed spontaneous pneumothorax, we usually uh, de um, relied on the conservative management, specifically the patients who were on NIV or who were mechanically ventilated. Who developed spontaneous pneumothorax, or more importantly, the pneumomediastinum? But I have done. I have tried to uh, mainly uh, go with the conservative management rather than putting ICD in all the cases, because I practically I have seen that uh, most of these cases uh, resolved in four to five days, or maybe a longer time. But uh, about thirty to forty percent of the patient did not require any intervention for 
when they develop pneumomediastinum on NIV or invasive mechanical ventilation. But yes, if the patient is having spontaneous pneumothorax, which is more than two centimeter patient is distinct, is desaturating, definitely then we have to put in the ICD, taking all the proper precautions. And so um, uh, coming uh, on to the main focus that is on how to manage these plural procedures, how to do the plural procedures if we have to do it. So whenever a patient of, comes to us who we are suspecting any uh, plural effusion, pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum, we should try to look for the symptoms whether the patient is really uh, suffering from COVID symptoms or not. And we should go for the nasal or oral pharyngeal swab. But what we have protocolized is like we do a rapid antigen uh, for all these patients who come to us for such procedures. Or if you do not have any time, uh, the time is less, patient uh, is quite dysnic and you cannot wait for two hours or three hours or even 24 hours to get the report. So you can go for a quick CT scan to look for any COVID related changes and take your precautions accordingly because uh, uh, you should know whether uh, you should always try to know whether your patient is COVID-19 or not, because it really makes a difference on your psychology also to and uh, the precautions that you need to take. Though we do take all these precautions generally also, but when we know that the patient is COVID, we do take a little bit more and we should try to know the status of the patients before going for the plural procedures, unless and until it is emerged, uh, it's life-threatening. So uh, we should um, uh, follow all the precautions of wearing the proper PPE, the checklist of uh, and document the steps using the pair proper two pairs of gloves, the gowns and the boot coverings as we um, usually do for seeing the COVID patient. And the, uh, the samples have to be uh, kept properly. These samples should be categorized as category three as the TB samples. And we should try to double back it. First, the sample uh, is put in a bag where the sample is collected in the procedural room. And then when it is taken out of the room, it is placed in another separate pre-labeled specimen bag, which is then transferred to the lab. And um, when the procedure is done, it has to be avoided. It, uh, none of the non-essential persons should come for at least 10 minutes after the procedure has uh, finished due to the persistence of viable viruses. So what measures can be minimize the aerosolization during ICD insertion and during thoracoscopy? One of the most important uh, measure, like we uh, we have uh, put in, uh, we have devised many uh, measures to do various procedures during uh, the this COVID time to decrease aerosolization. So, uh, using a viral filter uh, to the ICD tube is also one of the measures. This is a various one of the various dugards that we have invented during this. So, it is a very very effective measure, like using a simple antiviral filter that we use in commonly during our ventilated patients. And the, another thing that we need is a endotracheal tube. We need a proximal end of this five to six centimeter of our endotracheal tube that you need cut on and attached to the HME filter, that HME filter that we normally use in our ventilators. So this filters guarantees approximately 99% of these viruses to be filtered before the air goes in. Because when we put an ICD or a plural, uh, or uh, uh, ICD for plural effusion or for pneumothorax, there is a gush of air or gush of the fluid that comes in the water seal bags. So this leads to aerosolization and to the, and to the outlet. It contaminates the environment. So to prevent it, when we put an uh, air filter uh, at the outlet, so the air that comes, goes into the atmosphere is 99% filtered. So it decreases the risk of uh, transmission of the uh, infection to the procedure list, to the various healthcare workers. So what we need is a simple HME and an ET tube. And so uh, an ET tube, which, which this, this part can go into the water seal container and the blue part we attach to the HME. So this is the thing and uh, we can take care of a lot of part of the aerosolization. Another thing is we do have a, a pressure release valve, section uh, safety valve, which is present in the suction bottles. So uh, this is also can be a source of contamination. So uh, a source of aerosolization. So um, what we try to do is to seal it whenever we, we have the safety valves. Though it is a safety valve to prevent pneumothorax in case the suction is not working, but still it can lead to a lot of aerosolization and uh, we should try uh, to block it uh, uh, for uh, decreasing the transmission. So this, I've, uh, this 
putting a normal wall suction to the um, drainage system is also one of the thing we can put it to, uh, we can put the uh, this uh, the other end of the from the patient one one end goes to the patient and, and the other uh, drain we can put to the suction catheter and we can put an uh, uh, the uh, viral filter in between to prevent uh, to further uh, decrease the risk so putting the into the wall section will not directly release the air uh, into the atmosphere so this is one of the measures to decrease aerosolization another thing we can do is putting the bleach to the water seal chamber we may add 1 ml of bleach to the 50 1 is to 50 ratio can be added so whenever the uh, the, uh, the the fluid which is infected with uh, various viral uh, uh, rna or the air which is coming into this water it gets uh, disinfected by the bleach before it goes out to the outlet other measures that need to be taken are before starting the procedure we all should there should be a checklist the whole drainage system should be set up uh, while doing the procedure the patient face can be turned to the opposite side and advise him to wear a surgical mask if the patient is not getting breathless or if it's not suffocated with that we can make a skin incision as small as possible so as to avoid any air leak or the fluid leak around the tube and to prevent the gush of air and the gush of fluid that comes out once an ICD is put. Once, uh, as I told that once we put open the pleura, there is always a gush of air that comes out because of the sudden decompression. This can contaminate, this can lead to aerosolization. So to prevent this, we should always try to put uh, wet gauze on with the non-working hand on the incision so that the gush of air or the gush of uh, fluid can be prevented. Uh, and ICD should be clamped or connected to the drainage system before incision to the pleural cavity. Before uh, inserting the ICD, you should clamp it so that the gush of air doesn't come out or it should be connected to the drainage system so as to make it a closed system. And so that the system is not open to the air, the, there is no gush of air, no gush of water on you. And, um, and there is another thing which we can do is putting the whole water seal drain into a loose, into a loose closed plastic bag. So uh, the air that escapes through the outlet will be in the plastic bag. And once you are done with the procedure, you can discard that plastic bag. This is also one of the measures which we have developed during this so that degrees of aerosolization. And if the patient is mechanically ventilated, we may hold the ventilation when we are before entering the plural space or until the connection of the tube is done into the drain so as the patient um, does not cough, the patient is comfortable and there is no gush of air or gush of water. And uh, the skin incision that we do at the end of the procedure should be tight enough so that to prevent any leakage from the sides or any uh, leakage of the fluid from the sides. And the filter that I have told can be put to the drainage system has to be replaced every 24 hours. And how to do it is you have to clamp the tube, uh, the ET tube that the part we have taken, you have to cover it with a gauze and you clamp it to uh, make sure that the, uh, that the tube is uh, occluded, fully occluded. And then you remove the filter, replace it with a newer one, and then you can again declamp uh, your ET tube. So this you have to do it every 24 hours for the effective uh, working of the filters. And you have to check regularly that the filter is not uh, working properly and the tube is not kinked or occluded. Otherwise, it can lead to a kind of uh, tension pneumothorax if the patient is having pneumothorax. So uh, removal of PP should be taken in a dedicated place. And if the, uh, during the procedure, if there is any breach of PPE or there is a lot of spurting of uh, water on the procedure list, then uh, and the one who is doing the procedure should be replaced. He should Im interrupt the procedure immediately and should be replaced by another person who can further carry on the procedure. And while removal of ICD also, you should first clamp the tube and then remove it so as to um, decrease the aerosolization when you detach the system from the drainage and the the, uh, the pleural cavity is open to the atmosphere. So you should clamp, uh, clamp the ICD and then remove it. So particularly these, all these were pertaining to thoracoscopy also, but specific precautions that we mean we may take during thoracoscopy is adequate sedation and analgesia so that the patient is comfortable, he is not comfy at all. Uh, so uh, decreasing the coughing, decreasing the uh, splash of the verb, because I have seen multiple times, especially when we uh, you are doing rigid thoracoscopy, whenever there is a massive pleural effusion, you put the trocar and you uh, put on your scope, there is the initial 
uh, there is a lot of uh, fluid that comes out of the cavity. Sometimes there is uh, just a splash of water that is the fluid that comes on and it can spill onto your PPE kit and all. So to minimize that, uh, the patient should be comfortable and uh, we, we can use one-way trocars, uh, which we, uh, that can be done to, for the access to the pleural cavity and providing the proper seal at the entrance floor to prevent the minimal spilling and to get the minimal sp spillage of the fluid. We can cover the face of the patient. Uh, we turn the face to the opposite side and cover it with a, a sterile sheet so that uh, if, even if the patient coughs, uh, he's not coughing on uh, your face or on the other healthcare workers. This was a, uh, uh, an article uh, abstract which was published in European Respiratory Journal in 2021, which compared the two, uh, which uh, emphasized the fact that during this COVID era, we should, uh, we may directly go for medical thoracoscopy for undiagnosed pleural effusions. So there were two groups, group one where they did aspiration as well as medical thoracoscopy at the same point when the patient presented and in the group two, when the medical thoracoscopy was done after inconclusive uh, cytology. That is the usual guideline that first you uh, subject the patient to the cytological analysis. If, if it is negative, then you go for the medical thoracoscopy. But in this COVID era, we cannot keep calling the patients again and again. The uh, patient cannot come to collect the reports after seven days and again convince the patient for medical thoracoscopy. So if um, in this uh, uh, study, they... Uh, came to the conclusion that straight to medical thoracoscopy approach reduced the time of diagnosis, the number of patients visit to the hospital, and the number of invasive procedures uh, that was done on the patient, and there was less strain on hospital resources. So when we we do suspect the patient is a smoker, is, is, uh, uh, is aged, and we are suspecting malignancy, Rather than going on direct, um, going on for three cytologies and waiting for the reports to come, we may directly go for the medical thoracoscopy and doing both the procedures at the same time to maximize our yield, to reduce the time of diagnosis, reduce the number of hospitalization, reduce uh, uh, proper utilization of the resources. When we have so much of uh, we have so much of burden on COVID, so this this has to be decided on case to case basis. But this could be one of the options when uh, we have lots of, lots of strain on our resources, and uh, we might directly go for medical thoracoscopy rather than going for the cytology first and then uh, going on to MD. So uh, this is very important that we have to try uh, our IP procedures according to the stage of the COVID. Uh, when, they, when there is an exponential increase of new cases or rapid increase of new cases, as it was in the second wave in last year, when March to May, when uh, uh, the second wave was rampant. So in that case, we, might, uh, we may go only for urgent cases. And elective but non-delayable cases, we may evaluate on case to case whether we should do it now or we may be able to delay it for a few days or a few weeks. But when there is a decrease in the new cases or absence of new cases in the last two weeks, then yes, we should go for urgent cases in full capacity. Elective, I think, yes. Elective and non-delayable cases, as I have told, we should now adapt ourselves to the new normal and go for the elective. But where it the procedure is indicated, we should go in for full capacity. So we have to adapt it to this no, uh, new normal. Postponing procedure is not the solution. Using the HME filter to the water seal drainage system, the digital drainage system, use of wall suction, adding sterilizing agent to the water in drain, apart from the various measures that uh, small tips with, that we have dis just discussed, these may be the possible and effective ways to decrease the aerosolization. And yes, Universal COVID precautions are must, they have to be taken. So um, in a nutshell, uh, uh, interventions during the COVID time or uh, even uh, we can say during this time, they are very, very important. We cannot go away saying that no COVID is going, we cannot do the interventions. Whenever indicated, wherever indicated, we have to uh, decide on case to case basis. And I would say go for the procedure if indicated straight away rather than postponing it. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shweta, ma'am, for a wonderful talk on uh, uh, 
thoracoscopy covid clearance so all my job is almost done with the previous two talks but uh, just uh, to summarize now this is very important for us like pulmonologists i have been given the topic of guidelines to give pre operative clearance for non thoracic cases in covid positive patients so when you are called for fitness as a pulmonologist what uh, should be done so i am dr bharat toshniwal i am uh, i bring greetings to you from the city of nanded in maharashtra it's a, a pilgrimage city for the sikh community so let's uh, go to our topic there are very specific guidelines see all of us are still learning in covid so this is what a cdc guideline earlier it was that how long you should pay, uh, wait to have elective surgery first we'll talk about elective surgery for a patient who has confirmed covid 19 infection so very specifically they mentioned that at least 24 hours since resolution of fever without the use of fever reducing medications and improvement in respiratory uh, symptoms and at least 10 days since symptoms first appeared this is for mild to moderate cases and when there is severe cases or immunocompromised patients then the guidelines say ki at least 10 days and up to 20 days since uh, the symptoms have passed at least 24 hours since resolution of fever without the use of fever reducing medication and improvement in respiratory symptoms and the symptoms in general like cough, shortness of breath have improved. So these are the first guidelines which had come up for elective surgeries in uh, uh, patients who were confirmed COVID-19 positive. If you want to remember in a nutshell, it is it should be like four weeks for an asymptomatic patient or recovery only from mild respiratory symptoms. Six weeks for symptomatic patients who did not require hospitalization. 8 to 10 weeks for symptomatic patients who may be diabetic, immunocompromised or hospitalized and 12 weeks for a patient who was admitted in ICU due to a COVID-19 infection. So first take home slide from uh, my end for elective surgeries is this. You remember this uh, uh, duration while giving fitness. What about uh, the uh, procedural recommendations? They say limit all the non-essential planned surgeries and procedures, especially dental, until further notice. This was the first guideline I am talking about. To aggressively address COVID-19, they recognize the conservation of critical resources such as ventilators and the PPEs, which were very essential as limiting exposure of patients and staff to this deadly virus. Dental procedures or as we have told in the past two uh, lectures that aerosol generating procedures are uh, considered to be the highest risk of transmission. So uh, if at all it is very necessary, use proper PPE and if it can be postponed or delayed, it is very uh, good that you can uh, delay that procedure. This is a tired framework which was uh, set up to inform the health system as they consider resources and how best to provide surgical service and procedures to those whose condition requires emergent or urgent attention. This point is very important that the decision it always remains to the responsibility of the local healthcare delivery system including state and local health officials and those surgeons who have direct responsibility to their patients. What is happening now that we are, this was very early, but now COVID is like two, two and a half years old. So we are not delaying everything, but it has to be a case to case uh, basis selection, depending on the local surgeon, the operating surgeon and its team to decide the urgency or the need of the operation done. If it can be postponed, in a confirmed COVID-19 positive patient, you have to, if at all not, then you have to do with what precautions uh, I will tell in the further slide. 
in analyzing the risk and benefit of any planned procedure not only must the clinical situation be evaluated but resource conservation must also be considered these recommendations are meant to be refined over the duration of the crisis based on the feedback from the subject matter experts what if at all you are going to operate or do any procedure on a covid 19 patient there should be supply of pp to the facilities there should be proper staff availability bed availability and an icu availability for isolation of covid 19 post op patients should be ventilator availability should be there because we don't know which patient will behave how after his or her ot health and age of the patient should always be considered given the risk of the concurrent covid 19 infection during recovery very important and always the bottom line should be the urgency of the procedure if it can be delayed or hold for for a certain amount of time it is always better to do that because we don't know what post op covid complicate or complications you might be uh, you might have to face in a confirmed covid 19 positive patient this is my second take home slide if you want to remember these are the five rules for elective surgical procedures during this outbreak you should test a symptomatic patients before elective surgery with the knowledge of the sensitivity and availability of pcr at your institute do not use ct chest as screening method except for certain types of surgeries like a thoracic surgery it is not always uh, recommended do not rely on antibody test for screening and implementation of infection control measures reduce the number of your or staff and entering and exiting the or be sure that the healthcare workers have the appropriate and optimum pp during the operations so these are five very important points when and if you are going to deal with a covid 19 uh, positive patient for surgical interventions uh this is one slide which shows if the patient was previously covid 19 positive and posted for elective surgery what all investigations you should do so for any major procedures requiring general anesthesia whether the patient was asymptomatic or symptomatic it is always better to do all battery of pre op investigations only in cases when the patient is undergoing a minor procedure with or without general anesthesia and he or she was asymptomatic few tests like the ptt d dimer fibrinogen nt pro bnp ldh ferritin pre albumin they can be avoided otherwise it is always better that you do all your pre op workup in a, a treated covid 19 case especially the x ray the ecg if at all required an echocardiogram now what as uh, what uh, are the pp uh, you should use during a surgical uh, intervention in a covid 19 case i think all has been discussed just uh, i would like to summarize that a triple layered surgical mask or a n95 face mask they are very much needed when performing an aerosol generating procedure or in an area where neonates are being provided respiratory support eye protection goggles or face shields now we use a lot of them body protection you should give long sleeve water resistant complete gown including the head and shoe cover a single piece head to toe water resistant body cover will be ideal for attending resuscitation in delivery room or ot hand protection should be well fitting glove should be used now this is a very recently i came across this just two or three days ago now this has become common perform 10 successive uh, uh, perform deliveries of 10 success a uh, 10 covid positive women successfully so i think in this is from maharashtra but maybe everywhere we are dealing with these things the a fear or the phobia which was there initially during the first or second wave has uh, gone down a bit we know what precautions we have to take we can't deny cases now we have to treat them but yes you have to be cautious and take proper precautions for it coming to the end of my talk just what uh, you can postpone or what uh, you cannot postpone there is 
an arbitrary guideline again i think it is a personal call but uh, something like a colonoscopy cataracts or a carpal tunnel release uh, operation or endoscopies you can postpone them you can considering post postponing surgeries related to some spine or ortho or uh, hip or knee replacement and uh, uh, some elective angioplasty stable ureter colic you can considering waiting for them uh, my friends we can't do spirometry at least for one month uh, in a confirmed covid-19 positive case so some things in this might require a pft uh, pre op to give fitness you can consider postponing them if at all there is no dire emergency but certain cases like most cancers neurosurgeries highly symptomatic patients uh, cardiac patients with symptoms vascular surgeries obviously surgeries related to obgy field you cannot postpone them so all you have to do is take proper precautions you need to have a, a proper isolation ward you have to tell the operating surgeon ki you have to have a proper isolation setup post uh, uh, ot obviously all ppes and the staff uh, should be uh, covered in all ppes and then you can uh, only operate on them so the take home messages from this talk which is a very weird but it's a good point that unless emergency it is always advisable to postpone elective surgery by 6 weeks in confirmed covid positive patients the case to case decision to be taken by operating doctor in this ever changing uh, covid scenario proper isolation ward icu and pp gear should be practiced by the surgeon and his team no one has mastered covid yet so it is always better to explain risk to the patients and relatives in the current medico legal scenario sorry you don't know what the patient might behave post op so it is always better when you are doing what might be the procedure on a covid 19 positive patient it is always better to explain the post op risk we don't know which patient might suffer embolism or uh, some other uh, form of complications so thank you very much i thank cci for this opportunity and uh, we will discuss the questions in the next session thank you so the, i think now we'll move to the question answer session uh, and as a conductor of an orchestra i think my job has become very easy all the orchestra has been uh, held very beautifully i would what i would like to do is uh, if you can post any question if you have any queries please post it in the question uh, box what we will do is convert every scenario possible into a clinical scenario and uh, ask my panelist a rapid fire round so that to speak because i think everything has been discussed in details dr balaraj dr shweta and dr bharat have explained everything very beautifully so i guess let's start with the first question i will come to dr bharat if you see a 70 year old male who is a smoker and has got admitted for an inguinal hernia surgery now this is kind of redundant question but what if he is found to be incidentally covid positive and you are called for fitness what would you do would you give a fitness for such a patient dr bharat so it will depend on what kind of or what stage the hernia is if it is in like a strangulation or a emergency one we obviously have to operate mm -hmm. and uh, if not if the patient is stable enough if the surgeon thinks uh, we can wait the patient is covid positive i think it will be better uh, to wait so it depends Uh, how medically emergency the situation is yeah i agree and it will also depend on how clinically stable the patient is right. you know yeah if the patient has say a respiratory distress as in ards or a cytokine storm maybe it would be wise even to wait for a day or a few hours at least before we even operate a strangulated hernia but like if if you are called for a fitness patient is totally asymptomatic would you do a pft in such a case because the surgeon the anesthetist wants a pft in every case you know oh no if the patient is confirmed covid positive maybe incidentally it is not advisable to do a pft in such cases we have to wait for that i am sure you can't do pft in a what 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 would you use i mean what would be other parameters you in brief at least couple of uh, sentences what would you we, use we can uh, assess as you said clinically how is his respiratory rate 
what is his saturation is he having any respiratory discomfort as it is incidental positive maybe he might be okay and uh, obviously saturation whether he is having some kind of happy hypoxia ask for vaccination status definitely and then uh, you can take a call on this okay. a chest x ray hrct can be done if at all required now this this question thank you dr bala this next question i would like to ask all the panelists or whosoever is ready to answer that if a surgeon asks you point blank like you, like would you advise a covid test for a patient when asked for a fitness like there is no symptom patient has got admitted for say an elective knee replacement or um, or a elective hernia surgery for that matter there are no symptoms pulmonary wise would you suggest uh, a covid test and will a vaccination status of such a patient affect your decision anyone i mean dr balaraju dr shweta yeah um, so i feel uh, i don't think we'll get a chance to order the covid test so it's already done <laughs> yeah. so yeah so it, we need to it, do in all the cases yes sir yes it's already done then then they are going to ask whether should you should i proceed with the surgery or should i wait for the surgery but uh, before you speak about covid the covid test is already done in most 99.9% of the cases i have never called to say should i do a test never so people are shit scared that everything is just like a routine test the covid test has been uh, uh, done as a prior to any procedure okay so okay. lots of patients who are coming for elective surgeries are coming positive so it should be a part of the regular follow matlab pre operative assessment that covid test is a must because incidental uh, like uh, coincidental findings are there and vaccination status is must but even in vaccinated patients who had received two doses of the vaccination pe people are still coming positive so we have to do covid test in any ways yeah so as we discuss it may not alter my decision for surgery if it's an urgent surgery but at least we'll yes. have some documentation and probably prepare for the post op complications that we Definitely. might face yes uh, so dr balaraju this question is for you uh, a smoker lung mass needs a bronchoscopy for evaluation and there are no other symptoms suggestive of covid and what would you do you would go in with a bronchoscopy you would do a covid test let's say uh, patient has say a family member who had fever and suspect covid what would you do in such a case yeah see uh, once the patient is covid positive in your case uh, elderly man with a lung mass so you require some diagnosis and uh, to stage that case to proceed for a definitive therapy so this will fall under the semi semi urgent uh, category so in that semi urgent category so you need to decide uh, you can't just defer the case because obviously you need to diagnose and because diagnosing itself is going to take some time in the pathology so you need to consider everything but i feel in this day and age now with covid doing so much uh, becoming like an endemic uh, uh, disease as of now i would feel that i would go ahead and do the procedure with utmost all the precautions so if he is an elderly male so you take all the precautions and uh, go ahead and do the biopsy okay okay yeah we would i mean we would not want to delay the diagnosis maybe the surgic it might be a surgical case after all and may turn out to be non surgical if we delay the uh, diagnosis by around couple of weeks so uh, coming to the another question dr bharat um, a patient gets posted for cabg you know has been has come with a chest pain and angiodont triple vessel disease and there's a covid swab which is negative as we all said even before we are called covid test is done at least an antigen test is done even in a uh, in a you know any casualty so now covid swab is negative you have been called for fitness would you do a ct scan for such a patient is it like a common practice in your area or is it like a non necessary test no 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 it is not a common practice in my area if the patient is having some respiratory symptoms then probably yes uh, coincidentally today i saw one such case but the patient was positive but as it was an emergency procedure uh, with all due precautions the cardiologist uh, it, it was not cabg it was uh, uh, angio ramen angioplasty but so they had to do it so patient was positive but uh we could not we didn't have the time to do the ct also the patient was so bad so immediately we had to shift the patient to cath lab but if the swab is negative and patient is not having any respiratory symptoms no we we do a chest x ray and that is it not a ct scan so i can tell you one thing sometimes we do get a call where a swab is done which is negative but to be doubly sure people do a ct scan 
एंड नाउ यू डू अ सीटी एंड यू फाइंड वन स्मॉल जीजीओ ठीक है व्हाट आई टेंड टू डू इज आई डोंट टेंड टू रिपीट अ कोविड टेस्ट इज देयर एनीबॉडी एल्स हु वुड डिफर फ्रॉम दैट और इज एवरीबॉडी एग्रीज विद द सेम वी आल्सो विल रिपीट एट लीस्ट या सो इन अ इन अ पेशेंट हु इज एसिम्टोमेटिक प्रोबेब्ली सच टेस्ट विल हैव नो मेजर मीनिंग नाउ डॉक्टर श्वेता uh there is a 32 year old female um needs an lscs probably not progressing labor and and covid antigen test has come positive now uh, dr brothers already mentioned but is there anything which you would like to tell the operating surgeon and you know, any precautions or any specific thing or would you try for normal delivery any such thing uh so in the decision the mode of delivery does not differ if it, if the patient is covid positive or not it depends upon the operating surgery if a lses has to be done it has to be if it is the mode of delivery does not differ does not depend upon the positivity of the patient another thing which can be taken care of is whether the patient needs general anesthesia or we can do with the epidural ones or with the regional anesthesia because general anesthesia the intubation part is obviously an aerosol generating procedure much more than the epidural part so if we can uh, get away with a with a regional anesthesia that would be a better option but uh, uh, lscs if it is indicated we have to go for it uh, uh, obviously we have to take the regular uh, precautions of ppe and ev- everything but if we are going for general anesthesia the whole team has to be in ppe and uh, uh, extra precautions have to be taken or uh, maybe a rapid sequence intubation won't be done probably yeah. yes sir yes yeah, so that yeah. is so i think uh, the next question will go to dr balaraju there's a patient of cva and many of times they are uh, on a invasive ventilation and they have a collapsed lung and now we have been called for a, a bronchoscopy and for some reason a covid test has been done and the covid test is positive so first of all would you directly post him would you try alternative measures and what precautions would you take you have actually enlisted everything but in short maybe if you can uh, yeah. repeat yeah so again this uh, indication comes in a semi urgent uh, list so as you have already told um, obviously we will definitely will not post immediately to a bronchoscopy we try all the measures positioning suctioning ambu ventilation all that stuff even though if it is not um, getting better with uh, ambu positioning chest physio probably yes you need to perform a bronchoscopy for a clearance of the secretions probably some mucus plug or a blood cl- blood clot something so probably you need to do a, a bronchoscopy with utmost precautions so there there may be a role of uh, a single use bronchoscopy if the local factors agree because that's the advantage of having an uh, a small portable bronchoscope so you can easily carry over uh, that uh, unit into your uh, icu room so you don't have to carry all the big carts and uh, trolleys and all uh, into the icu in the covid icu you can just straight away use that uh, small portable bronchoscope again it's not mandatory it's just like your local own factors if the factors are not available if the specialty is not available probably you will go with with a reusable bronchoscope okay now coming to dr shweta if there is a patient of rta who's got admitted in a casualty got intubated and probably you do a ct and you find a collapsed lung and probably there is a blood clot which is expected you have been called to assess the patient maybe help out to remove the plug and rt pcr has not been done or has been done and the report is still awaited now how will you proceed i mean would you do the intervention would you do try something else what would you do yeah it uh, it uh, it all depends upon what's the clinical condition of the patient as such whether the patient is uh, too much hypoxemic the if the what is the oxygen requirement is it 30 to 40% or is it 100% also is the patient hemodynamically stable so overall clinical picture of the patients does matter because if the pa- patient is hemodynamically unstable the uh, it's the patient is on 100% fio2 still not maintaining saturation then we need to go immediately immediately for it's a kind of a life threatening situation so we need to do the bronchoscopy and uh, get away with uh, the mucus plugging or the blood clot but if the patient is not so unstable the patient is maintaining on 30 to 40% fio2 it's it's okay and he has already been intubated then we may try for the chest physiotherapy if there is no any rib cage uh, injury and we may try for the nebulized mucolytics and wait for a few hours because most of these acute chest collapse if it occurs they do open in a day or uh, in a tw- within 24 hours but if the patient is unstable then we definitely have to go f- um, straight away for the procedure irrespective of the covid status with all the precautions to be taken 
Yeah, so the way I see it, it's it's a stable patient. You may try alternative therapies yes. if it's an acute collapse. If it's a chronic collapse, or maybe a little more time has passed, maybe the therapies might not work, and you may still end up doing a bronchoscopy. Yes, but if yes, it's an yes. unstable patient, you have to save the patient. There is no uh, second doubts about it, and you have to go ahead with everything. Great, great. Dr. Bharat, um, see, you've been called for a reference, a 66-year-old male, a smoker with massive hemoptysis, get admitted in the ICU, still not on ventilator, but you're called for a pulmonary reference, probably an SOS copy, X-ray has been done showing a patch, RT-PCR uh, is unknown, still has been sent, how will you proceed? I think Dr. Bala sir will answer this better, but it falls under a uh, emergency procedure, I feel. So with proper precautions, I think we'll have to, because massive hemoptysis needs to be controlled. Mala, sir? Yes, uh, true. So as much as possible, see, uh, by the time you have a massive hemoptysis, before you are called, the anesthetist would have incubated the case. Yeah. So most of the times, the first thing uh, foremost is to secure the airway as much as possible. So once you secure the airway and you feel that the hemoptysis is stopped, probably you you might think of uh, straight away send them for embolization, bronchiolar embolization. Or if the airway is not secured or there is so much of blood clots, probably, yes, you need to take all precautions and uh, do a bronchoscopy. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, coming to you, Dr. Balaraju, I mean, see, if there's a patient who is COVID positive on invasive ventilation and develops a new patch and uh, you want to know whether it's infective, fungal, I mean, many times in the first and the second wave, uh, we've had at least in Mumbai, a lot of mucor and a lot of aspergillosis secondary to the immunosuppressants, uh, immunosuppressants that were used. So if there's a new patch, COVID positive on ventilator, how would you proceed? Would you do a bronch? Uh, yeah, uh, so if you talk about um, diagnosing VAP, um, uh, diagnosing VAP in a ventilated patient, so probably I would consider doing a mini ball in this case mm -hmm. straight away. So before I do a bronchoscopy, because if I, many of the studies have shown that mini ball is not bad enough, so you can diagnose uh, many of it uh, with uh, mini ball. If you have a diagnosis with the mini ball, I think it's more than sufficient. You don't have to do a, uh, a bronchoscopy. But again, if its situation uh, decides, if it is a very, very high risk patient, immunocompromised, you need to have a definitive diagnosis when the other physicians also feel that you need to have a definite degree. Probably we may consider a bronchoscopy, but probably that will not be the first line. So if this say it's a post kidney transplant patient, COVID positive yes. on ventilation, maybe you might proceed yes. for a bronchoscopy. Might, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, and suppose if you have a patient who has been intubated, now extubated, was on tracheostomy for some time, and many times this patient come with strider. So he was intubated for COVID, extubated, now you suspect of stenosis. Patient has got reintubated within three months. And now you find do a COVID test again for whatever reason and it's positive. Now, what would you do? You... Yeah. Uh, so if you look at the indications for this, uh, if it is significant uh, symptomatic uh, airway obstruction, probably yes, you need to straight away have to relieve the airway obstruction irrespective of the COVID status. You need to take all the full precautions. And if it is mild uh, symptomatic uh, uh, airway stenosis probably you you might wait for a couple of weeks before uh, they become uh, covid negative or become covid low suspect but again if the patient is have a significant strider yes probably you have to go and relieve the strider yeah, and if the patient has come positive within three months maybe it's a false positive you know yes, yes yeah yes. you may get false positive for such true. a patient also true, true. and i think true. the same thing applies for foreign body right if there's a yes. foreign body and if it's um, low suspect, maybe you just go ahead and remove it. If yes. it's a suspect foreign body, I'm not talking a diagnosed X-ray CT, then you have to go and relieve the obstruction. Yes. Okay. Um, like coming to Dr. Shweta, if you see uh, like a young 21-year-old male has fever, loss of weight, loss of appetite, right side chest pain, X-ray shows a right uh, pleural effusion. In a normal circumstance, I would advise an ultrasound guide to rule tab. But now patient got admitted and it's, uh, you know, the antigen is positive for COVID. What would you do? You would tap, you would wait, treat with antibiotics, so on. Um, so, uh, since the patient has a, an acute history of 10 to 14 days and the patient is young, so we are um, more looking into the benign category. The, the TDs would be more of benign. And uh, since the patient has come to be that positive, so we might go with 
the more common DDs would be either if it's a bacterial pneumonic effusion or something, or it could be tuberculosis. So we might go for antibiotics and we might wait for maybe seven to ten days before going for the tab because because these are benign conditions and we might we may wait for uh, maybe seven to ten days. And if we are confident about the diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis, we may start with empirical ATT also before going for a tap after a week or so. I would say. Another possible, another thing would be to go for a CT scan and look for other uh, uh, indicators of tuberculosis or any other consolidation. If we uh, and, uh, the mediastinal lymphadenopathy or any cavity we could find or any other mark, uh, the signs, radiological signs for bacterial pneumonia, as if uh, we are suspecting. So, so yeah, now I change the scenario. It's not a 21 year old male. It's a 68 year old male and has been exposed to asbestos for because of his occupation. Would you still follow the same guidelines or you would like to do something different? So if he has ex exposure of asbestos and we are thinking in terms of asbestos related pleural effusion, then uh, again, I would like to wait. But if yeah. the scenario is like he's a smoker and I am finding a lung mass, if the patient is quite symptomatic and we need to have an early diagnosis, we are thinking of malignancy of any squamous or small cell carcinoma, then I would definitely go straight away with the diagnostic or bronchoscopy if required for the biopsy or for the pleural tapping. So it all depends upon the history of the patient. The yeah, so you might at least do an ultrasound and check if you find pleural nodules. Probably if it yes. shows looks like malignant or yeah, shouts yes, malignant, yes. maybe you need to diagnose it as soon as possible. Uh, there is a comment from Dr. Vijay Kumar. He said that if patient is doing an angiography, maybe may, you may not need a CT, but for a sternotomy, uh, a CT screening might be required, which probably the surgeon might not be comfortable without getting a CT done, whether knowing whether he's going to get exposed to the, uh, any viral dose or not. And in the question box, I'm just happy to announce that everybody is just happy that Dr. Krishna's birthday is here today. He have been wishing him. So again, Dr. Krishna, very happy birthday uh, today. I hope you have a great year. Now, coming back to Dr. Shweta again, if you have a COVID positive patient, as I'm admitted for like, like an ARDS cytokine storm picture, and now you see a daily X-ray sometimes is done in ICUs and you find a fresh effusion on an ICU. Take care. Now, would you go and tap it? Would you? How would you progress? Uh, so uh, it uh, again depends upon how, first of all, how much is effusion, whether it's mild, moderate or massive. And if it's mild to moderate, I would uh, rather look for an alternative causes. I would look for the other etiologies. So now the patient is in ARDS, he has been ventilated. So is there any associated secondary pneumonia which has led to the pleural effusion or hypoproteinemia or the patient is in fluid overload which is leading to the, uh, to the effusion. So uh, I would rather uh, go uh, with the investigations, uh, the other investigations uh, rather than going for the pleural tap. Only if the patient is too much hypoxemic, we are finding massive pleural effusion, which is com compromising the lung and uh, uh, it's uh, leading to hypotension or some, some hemodynamic lung. Only then I would like to go for a tap if uh, we, I have ruled out other causes of uh, the pleural effusion in such cases. Okay. Great. So if you have a mild effusion, maybe you can wait if it's... Yes, definitely. If your no, patient no, is throwing a fever spike and you suspect an infection, you may go ahead and put a needle and get a sample out. And uh, maybe in such a case, other markers like blood markers, procalcitonin, all those things might also mm -hmm. help to diagnose whether we are looking at a secondary infection. Now, coming I mean, Dr. Bharat, uh, you have a patient with COVID pneumonia. And as we discussed, many such patients on invasive ventilation or on non-invasive develop pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. So many a times, these patients also require central line. And very commonly, the most common, I mean, you get one of the commonest complications is pneumothorax. So if there's a pneumothorax due to any such reason, and obviously, the patient needs an ICD. Uh, what precautions would you take? I'm sure it has been discussed in the uh, this um, lecture, but now it's a call. You have been called in the middle of the night at two o'clock. There's a pneumothorax. We try to put a center line. What would you do? What precautions would you take? Oh, I think this one everyone here might have faced during past two years. We obviously have to put in an ICD. We don't in a uh, first thing is proper uh, aseptic precautions along with the PP kit. Try to keep the staff uh, staff minimum. And few new things I learned from today's madam's lecture is uh, the one-way seal wall if we can use because the aerosol generation if we can reduce 
एज द पेशेंट इज कोविड पॉजिटिव दैट विल बी मोर हेल्पफुल आई थिंक सबने ही कभी ना कभी कोविड पॉजिटिव पेशेंट को आईसीडी तो डाला ही है अभी दो साल में तो yeah so i mean it's it's yeah as you said everybody is still learning so we are still going to learn new things doing bronchoscopy thoracoscopy in active pleurisium maybe just consider it as any other infection in future so yeah it will be very important to take all the precautions uh, make sure that the staff is minimum wear the proper pp kit many a times i mean at least that i have faced pp kit may not be readily available yeah considering now that since covid has become uh, you know not so severe not we don't have dedicated covid hospitals in many areas yeah so you might just get a gown and a face shield and a mask and probably you have to deal with that so saving patients life is paramount so we have to go ahead with it and just pray that uh, we are able to handle the viral load that we are facing now this will be going to all the panelists like in most of the nursing homes like if we are talking about air exchanges about cubicles it is good for big setups many a times we go to smaller setups where nursing homes don't have a cubicle structure or an isolation area and you need to do a scopy bedside in an intubated patient or a patient who is there hospitalized in the icu okay any other special precautions that you will take apart from what you have mentioned like you are going in a nursing home setup so don't we don't expect uh, ideally yes every nursing home should have ic should have air exchanges as per the infection control protocols but it may not be feasible for every small place but patient needs a bronchoscopy for lung collapse or for blood clot or for any such thing what precautions would you take everyone i would like to know, know everyone if there's anything what extra you might do maybe dr balaraj you can start yep uh, <clears throat> so what you said is absolutely right because uh, in most of the small uh, hospitals and the nursing homes uh, it's just like a ward with the open icu so cubicles uh, separation are probably very very difficult so i what what best we can do i think we should do so as much as possible you try to shift the patient to a corner somewhere and all try to get some curtains and all just to decrease the amount of droplet exposure i don't think probably that's going to change a lot but probably to reduce the number of staff in the icu temporarily so obviously everybody has to wear necessary precautions like gloves face and um, uh, n95 mask uh, aprons and all definitely yes and there if you have a, a normal bronchoscope uh, probably i would say no so fiber optic bronchoscope probably i would not recommend uh, doing the procedure because that's a direct exposure uh, to the airway it's always better to use a video bronchoscope as much as possible if you don't have a, a video bronchoscope yeah probably it's i don't think it's the it's the risk uh, to be taken directly taking doing it the fiber optic bronchoscope i would not encourage doing that so uh, as much as possible i think uh, whatever you have said you take all the precautions and uh, try to do it okay dr shweta dr bharat yeah. um distance between the beds can be increased a little bit maybe so that during the procedure we can increase the distance and impermeable curtains that sir has already mentioned i yeah. think yeah i i think i i come from a place where there is all nursing home only yahan pe we don't have any corporate setup it's a district place and i think many of our friends might be facing the same problem it is very congested uh, you have to as sir said i probably try and do that that to a corner agar kahi wahan ek ada window hai only one staff try to keep it uh, uh, less exposed but uh, i think apart from uh, cities or corporate cultures i think every tier 2 tier 3 cities in india have uh, faced this problem of uh, uh, nursing home or smaller places where नाउ अभी तो कोविड ऐसा है कि कॉम्बिनेशन पेशेंट है एक दो पॉजिटिव पेशेंट है कहीं वो ही बिल्डिंग में ऊपर के फ्लोर पे देर आर लाइक नॉर्मल पेशेंट सो वी आर डीलिंग विद इट वी आर लर्निंग विद यस वी हैव टू डील विद इट बिकॉज़ एज वी आई मीन सेम इन माय एरिया देयर आर कॉर्पोरेट हॉस्पिटल्स बट देयर आर आल्सो नर्सिंग होम्स आई माय सेल्फ रन अ नर्सिंग होम सो इफ आई हैव अ कोविड पॉजिटिव पेशेंट आई वुड वांट टू शिफ्ट बट टिल आई शिफ्ट आई नीड टू मैनेज द पेशेंट आई कैन नॉट जस्ट यू नो नॉट गिव पेशेंट एनी ट्रीटमेंट so i guess uh, i mean this was a very enlightening discussion even i learned a lot as dr bharat said uh, some jugad that we need to learn and as dr vijay kumar is saying probably dr balaraju will 
probably have a red carpet welcome for a robotic bronchoscopy in such scenarios. I don't know how we are going to shift such a patient for a robotic bronchoscopy from a nursing home, but hope so we'll uh, reach in uh, that thing in future. So um, if I would just like to wrap up uh, by saying first, the uh, birthday wishes from Dr. Bharat Bhushan, Dr. Kira Sibia, Dr. Jairaman, um, wishing Dr. Krishna a very happy birthday. And if there are no more questions, I would like to thank Dr. Krishna, Dr. Narayan Pradeep, Dr. Ravi, uh, uh, for giving us the opportunity to uh, present, or I would say be part of this um, webinar where we could discuss our own uh, problems. Um, Dr. Narendra, the national president is always standing behind us, uh, guiding us how to go ahead with such situations. Dr. Vijay Kumar, the backbone for all the webinars, and my esteemed panelists, Dr. Bala Reju, Dr. Bharat, uh, Dr. Shweta, and myself, Dr. Mayul Thakkar, I think we've learned enough today, and I think this should be winding up for the day. Any parting comments from my panelists? I would like to welcome. Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Krishna, sir, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Narayana, uh, for this uh, wonderful program. So even I have learned uh, from Shweta, ma'am, uh, all this jugad, what you have done with the thing. We have never thought of it. <laughs> We or we always used to just put a tube and just forget and go because as a consultant you don't stay still inside the ICU we don't know what's happening there. So uh, uh, I think uh, it's a new learning for me. So I've never thought about that uh, as of now. Thank you. Shweta, any parting comments, Dr. Bharat? Yeah, uh, I would uh, definitely would like to thank the whole CCI team and thank you, Dr. Dr. Mayur, also for a very nice moderation. And you have compiled all of us. Like, it's, it was a very good meeting and definitely a good learning experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. Yeah, thank you so much. CCI always comes up with unique topics to discuss, which we do routinely, but we don't discuss. So this was, again, one such topic. I loved it. And uh, thank you, CCI, all the team. Obviously, Mehul, sir, thank you so much for the wonderful questions. Good night, everyone. And take care. Stay safe from COVID. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good, Good night. night. All. Thank, Bye. you, sir. Good night. thank you. Thank you.